About 30 years ago, there was a popular book um, out called Parenting is Not for Cowards. And anybody who's ever raised a child knows exactly what that means. I mean, they can understand the meaning of that. Parenting is tough work. Amen? It takes courage and grit, tenacity, persistence, unselfishness, and a lot of other things. It definitely is not uh, for wimps. In fact, it may be the most demanding job that a human being uh, can have because it is uh, literally um, um, learning to raise another human being, which is incredibly complex. It's not by accident that parenting starts out with something called labor <laughs> because any mom can tell you uh, that it is incredibly tough just carrying a baby full term, much less delivering one. But that's the easy part uh, compared to the rest of it because it only gets harder as time goes on. The problem is, just about the time you get some insight and some experience underneath your belt, well, you find yourself unemployed because uh, uh, they are moving out of the nest and uh, just as you start to understand what you're doing. But none of us know what we're doing when we start out as parents. Amen? We just learned that kind of as we, as we go. Today we're starting a new series on the family. And I am thrilled to be able to bring you this series. I'm excited. I'm excited. I really am. I'm going to talk to you about how to build a foundation that produces an environment that is conducive for love in your home. And then we're going to look at the importance of growing healthy families and the purpose of family. Why did God create the family? Why has God put us uh, in a family? And then we're going to, uh, one week we're going to look at how to handle toxic family members. Any of you know a toxic family member? Okay. How to handle toxic family members. That ought to be a good one. You don't want to miss that one. And then we're going to look at why we should honor our parents and how to do that uh, uh, if you're an adult, how to honor your parents. And then we'll pivot and talk about how to affair-proof your marriage uh, and how to build integrity in your home and how to grow closer to uh, you people in your family and extended family members or how to set healthy boundaries uh, around some extended family. And the list goes on and on. I'm really, 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 really excited about this series, so you won't want to miss a Sunday. And oh, yeah, we're going to pause in there once or twice to celebrate Mother's Day uh, and Father's Day. And so for the next couple of months, that's the direction we're headed because we're all a part of a family. Amen? No matter what stage of life we're in, we're all a part of a family. And if there's anything that can produce more joy, and at the same time bring more pain in your life, uh, well then you're going to have to help me with that because I don't know what it is. So we're going to look at the different implications of that. But today we're going to start with how to bring out the best in your kids because we are dedicating, believe it or not, of five little ones at the end of the message today. You said, well, now, wait a minute, preacher. I wish I'd have known that because I'm not a parent. I would have stayed home because today doesn't apply uh, to me. Well, let me let you in on a little secret. This isn't just about how to bring out the best in your kids. Uh, uh, it's how to bring out the best in anybody because the Bible gives us five principles in, in, in God's Word. And if you'll do these things, you'll be able to bring out the best in your spouse. You'll be able to bring out the best in your boyfriend or girlfriend, your boss, your employee, your friend somebody in the church, uh, uh, anybody at all. And we're going to look at two of those five principles this weekend. And then next weekend, we're going to come back and we're going to look at the other three because I just didn't want to give you the whole bale of hay at once, right? Didn't want you to flounder. Uh, <laughs> the reason I wanted to do this series for a couple uh, of months is twofold. First, families today are in serious trouble. Somebody say amen. amen. We are. When I talk to parents, they're usually stressed out. They're overloaded, they are worried, they're worried about their children's education and the negative influence that a secular culture might have on their children's lives. They're certainly not living with margin, they're jumping from one event to the next and, and there are so many drivers inside and outside the home that are creating pressures on the family, pressures that we didn't even have even 15 years ago. The point is families need our support. And that's a big deal around here because we are a very, if you haven't noticed yet, a very family-friendly church. And we want to support uh, parents and kids uh, uh, in living out their faith so the families will not be stressed out. But there's another reason that this series or a series like this is important. And it involves those of you who are not parents. Maybe you're not a father or a mother and you never will be. It doesn't matter. You need young people in your life. Study after study has shown that when we don't have young people in our lives, we get ornery and persnickety. Come on now. All right? We, get, we do. We get ornery and we grow older faster. 
You start hardening your attitude towards things in your life. And so you actually need young people in your life. Kids help you grow slow. Mm. We help them grow, no doubt, but they help us to grow. uh, And kids are God's tool for teaching us unselfishness. And so you need kids uh, in your home or, or if you're married or, or you may have young kids in your home, excuse me, or you may be married or unmarried, it's really irrelevant. You need young people in your life and you're going to run across them, nieces and nephews and kids in the neighborhood and kids at church. We need multi-generations in our life because if you only have one generation in your inner circle, well, then you're going to be uh, a pretty boring person because you're only going to see life from one perspective. So all we need different kinds of generations. They teach us, meaning we need each other. And the Bible says that there are five principles uh, in bringing out the best in each other. And these are particularly important in bringing out the best in children. And again, we're just going to look at two of the five this morning. So let's jump right into it. The first way to bring out the best in your child is to accept their uniqueness completely. You might want to write that down on your outline, which is on the back of the bulletin that you received when you came in this morning. You need somebody to accept your distinctiveness. Everybody in life does. We all do. Every one of us needs somebody to accept our uniqueness, and we want to be accepted completely. So the starting point to bringing out the best in your child is to recognize their value and to recognize a person's individuality. If you've got more, one, uh, more than one child uh, in your family, you know that children are different, right? Each one of them are different. Children don't come in packs. They come as individuals. Uh, Even twins are not alike in many aspects uh, of the word, which means they have to be treated differently because we are all human beings. We are all different. By the way, God made each of us different intentionally. Look to somebody on your left and right and say, you are different. He could have just made us like machines that were built on a factory in heaven. We come off of a a conveyor belt, and we all look the same. We all talk the same. We all smell the same. We all uh, walk the same. We all like the same things, but he didn't, and I'm glad he didn't because if he did, this world would be a very boring place. Nobody wants to date somebody who they know everything about, right? I mean, totally. uh, 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 Nobody wants to do that. I don't know if you figured this out yet, but God loves diversity because he's never made any two of us that are exactly alike. If you don't believe me, look down your row, okay? (laughs) There's not a single person here that is exactly like another person here. Everybody looks and talks and smells and acts differently. Human beings might like to clone things today, and we do, but God obviously does not. Even identical twins are different in thousands of ways and no two snowflakes are alike and every human being on this planet has a different handprint, voice print, footprint, fingerprint and personality. Why? It's the way God works. God wants it that way. We are all unique. In Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10 it said, for we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Did you know that before you were born that God decided and prepared in advance what he wanted you to do with your life so God knows all the good things uh, that he wants you to do with your life and you can miss that plan but God created you for a plan and a purpose before you were even born you were custom designed the Bible said we are his workmanship and the word uh, workmanship excuse me and the word there in the Greek is the word poema which is a word we get our English word poem from. He's literally saying that we are like works of, we're like a work of art. We are God's masterpiece, okay? God created us, custom designed us, meaning each of your children are unique works of art. Sometimes I don't always understand works of art. There's some works of art over there on the bluff at that new modern works of art, and I don't always understand works of art, but they are definitely unique in the same way with kids. One of the reasons also, by the way, that God makes us all different so that everything gets done in the world. I want you to think about it. If we were all the same uh, and we all like the same stuff, we would leave a lot of stuff unliked or unaddressed or undone in the world. A lot of stuff wouldn't get done. Fortunately, there are people that like to work with numbers. I do not. I surround myself with people who do. Fortunately, there are people that like to work with numbers. They're good at math. They're good at engineering. They're good at an accounting. And there are others that go, well, you know what? I hate numbers, but I'm good, I'm good uh, with public speaking. And so I can speak in front of people. And there are other people who say, well, I hate public speaking, but I'm good mechanically. I'm good at sales or I'm good at closing deals. The point is God wired us all differently. And we all like to do the same stuff. A lot of stuff just wouldn't get done. And that's why we need each other. 
Some people are meant to be explorers and other people are meant to work in office cubicles and, uh, for their whole life. And that's just the way God created us. Uh, it takes all kinds. And it's God's plan. He decided us, uh, uh, he created us and designed us uniquely and differently. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 6 it says this. There are many ways in which God works in our life, but it is the same God who does the work in and through all of us who are his. So God works through different people in different ways. And the implication of that in parenting is this, and hear me clearly. You cannot treat all your children the same. Somebody say amen. Doesn't work. You probably read parenting books uh, or taken a parenting class where they say to be fair, you got to treat all the kids the same. Because if you don't treat all the kids the same, somebody's going to get hurt. So you got to treat all your kids the same. There's a word for that. It's called stupid. All right? You don't want to treat all your kids the same. Why? Because it may not work. What works with one kid may not work with another. And what you say to one might encourage him. But if you say that exact same thing to another, it might discourage him. With one, it builds him up. With the other, it causes them to want to give up. And we all react differently. So to be a good parent, you have to learn to treat your children differently because they're all different. And it all starts with this foundation of accepting a child's uniqueness completely. We are to love them equally, but treat them individually. Treat them differently. Somebody? Amen? Okay? One of the great tasks of parenting is to help kids recognize their uniqueness. They are originals. They were never meant to be carbon copies of you or somebody else. And so they don't have to compete with anybody else. Matter of fact, it doesn't work. It never works because they can't, uh, because they are unique. And a part of parenting is to help them see that, that they're not expected to be like everybody else. Why can't you be more like your brother or sister? Reason why is because God didn't create them like their brother or sister. And he wants them to be who God made them to be. God, he wants us to help our kids learn their uniqueness. Here's the problem. All right? There are two enemies that fight against your own uniqueness and fight against the uniqueness of your children and fight against the uniqueness of everybody in your row. All right? They are two enemies. It's a pressure to compare and the pressure to conform. They're in your outline there. Let's look at these for a moment. The first one is the pressure to compare, okay? The pressure to compare is everywhere today. It permeates our culture today, and it's worse today than it was even 20 years ago because we had this beautiful thing called social media, which is one big comparison tool. I take a picture of my dessert, and next thing I know, you got to have a picture of your dessert posted on the internet there, all right? I take a picture of me having fun on vacation, so you got to go take a picture of you having fun on vacation to show that you're having more fun. And it's constant comparison. And in America, we have made comparing an indoor sport. We compare academics and how good, uh, 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 how good a grades you got. And we compare athletics and how skilled and coordinated you are compared to somebody else. We compare uh, 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 looks. She's cuter than the other person. Or he's better looking than that guy that just came in church just now. We compare economic status. They have more money than I do. People even compare their lawns today. Well, his lines go this way, and I want my lines to go that way. You know, and people will compare all kinds of things like status and popularity and things like that. It's one of the reasons I don't like the IQ test, truthfully. I don't, because it's comparative. And we now know today through, uh, uh, through sociology, we know that there are about 11 or 12 different kinds of intelligence. An IQ test gauges only one kind of intelligence. If you know how to learn, if you learn, uh, know how to learn a bunch of ideas and write them down in a coherent uh, paragraph, then you are rated high in intelligence. But verbal intelligence is only one type of intelligence. There's mechanical intelligence, where some people just naturally know how to take things apart and put them back together, things that they have never seen before in their life. There's athletic intelligence, where people know how to move and do things in certain ways where other people can't or don't. There's musical intelligence. There's artistic intelligence. There's relational intelligence. Some people know how to get along better with others uh, than other people do. And by the way, that is a skill set that CEOs, once they know you have, will pay the most money for. Okay? They will. Not, not, uh, uh, not uh, academic intelligence. You have to have a modicum of understanding of the job that you're being hired to do. But if they understand and they know that you truly know how to get along with and motivate other people, I'm telling you, CEOs will pay up for that. That's something special. There's numeric intelligence and verbal intelligence and on and on. But the IQ test only scores one kind of intelligence. And we now know that you can score horrible on an IQ test, get bad grades in school, 
school and go out and build a business and become a billionaire because you have a different kind of intelligence. You may score low in one area like mechanical, but you're brilliant in another area like you're an artist or, or a musician and you become a millionaire because of it. Well, here's what I want to ask you. What does God have to say about this idea of comparing when we are all created to be unique? 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 12 said this, we do not compare to class, excuse me, we do not dare to classify or compare ourselves with some who commend themselves. When they measure themselves by themselves, when they measure themselves by each other and compare themselves with themselves, compare themselves to each other, they are not wise. One translation said, do not dare to compare for it is foolish. You need to teach your kids that. Somebody say, man, you should never compare your kids with somebody else's kids. You should never Compare your spouse with somebody else's spouse. Amen? You should never compare your job, your home, or anything else. For God said it's foolish because we're all unique. You can compare tangerines with submarines because they sound alike, but they are totally unique, and they are never going to be alike. And that is the same way it is with people. In Galatians chapter 6 and verse 4, it said this, Do your own work well, and then you will have something to be proud of. But don't compare yourself with others. It said, do your own work well. Do your own thing well. We need to teach that to our children. Don't worry about what other people are doing. Don't worry about somebody else's grades. Uh, do your best. Never compare yourself with others. Now, there is a legitimate kind of pride here. And that's what this verse is talking about. Where the Bible says that we can be, we can be proud of what we've done. Okay? It's a pride of having done the best you could or of have done, uh, having done a good job. And it's okay to be proud of that. But the moment you start comparing yourself to somebody else and say, well, I did a better job than he or she did, the Bible says that you've sinned and that's why God tells us don't compare. It's okay to do the best you can do or to be the best you can be and go, I'm really proud of what I did. Man, that pot roast turned out really, really good. But the moment you bring that pot roast into church and say, my pot roast is better than her, her ham, well, then you're in trouble here, right? And, and, and you're going down a slippery slope and God doesn't want us to do that. The Bible says it's foolish. But do we live today in a culture of comparison? Well, your kids, I promise you, come home every single day and they have compared the clothes that they wore to school that day to the clothes that other people are wearing or the music they're listening to and, every, uh, 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 and everything else with somebody else and it robs them of their uniqueness. Another enemy of uniqueness and another thing we fight as parents is the pressure to conform, conform. Another word for that is people pleasing, okay? And there is a huge amount of pressure to please other people. People pleasing is where you're worried, more worried about what other people think about you than you're worried about what God thinks about you. Conforming is the pressure to be like somebody else. When I see somebody on TV, I see Beyonce, or somebody on TV and I go, I want to look like that, or I want to dress like that, I want to be like that, okay? And, and, and so I begin to try to conform myself to look like her, or be like her, or walk or talk like her, or act like her. And the Bible said it's a trap. Proverbs chapter 29, verse 25, the first half of that verse said this, The fear of man lays a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord is safe. The Living Bible says the fear of man is a trap. Eh? And what that means is the moment I start worrying about what other people think of me, I'm going to be dead in the water. Because all of a sudden, they become my God, and, and I start molding my life after them. The little, let me let you live in on a little secret that's really, really important. I've said this before, I'll say it again. Many of you here today have already heard this. Number one, you don't need to be happy, or excuse me, you don't need somebody else's approval in order to be happy. Somebody say amen. Hey, you don't. You're as happy as you choose to be. So if you're sitting there today and you're unhappy, it's because you have chosen to be unhappy. It is, because happiness is a choice. And you don't need other people's approval in order to be happy. And I don't care what's going on in your life. I don't care what's happening to you. Some of you have been trying to get... Uh, the approval of your parents maybe for years, maybe for the last 50 years. They may be gone by now or you're trying to get, still get the approval of your daddy or some other body, a figure in authority or somebody else. Look, if you have not won their approval, you're probably not getting it. And I hate to be the one to give you that bad news, but here's the good news. You do not need it in order to have a successful life. And we need to teach that to our kids uh, so that they will cook comparing themselves or at least minimize it because the Bible calls it foolish. And, they, and, and, and if we'll teach it to them, then they will not feel this overwhelming pressure to conform uh, as much. Here's what Romans chapter 12 and verse 2 says about conforming. 
Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. So God says, do not conform yourselves uh, to other people, to the standards of this world. What's he talking about? He's talking about the value standard, the standards of value of this world. The world's value system, what the culture says about status and sex and salary and passion and position and possessions and appearance and academics and athletics. Uh, don't conform to the standards of this world, but let God transform you inwardly. How? By changing the way you think. God says, I don't want you to be like everybody else. I want you to be who I made you to be. Here's the problem. Kids face tremendous peer pressure today. And we tell them, well, don't let other people push you into their mold. Uh, don't do that. Don't do that. Don't follow the crowd and, and, and do wrong and go on and on. But you know what? We turn around as parents and tend to push them uh, uh, to conform to the world's standards as much as anybody else. Because we want our kids to fit in. We want our kids to be accepted. We want our kids to be normal and fit into school and be like everybody else. Uh, and so we want them to fit in with normal patterns of the world. When God is saying, no, they are unique. And I want them to be different from the world. But we keep trying to get them to conform and behave like everybody else. Uh, so, because we want to look like a good parent. But the way you bring out the best in your kid is to accept them and anybody else uh, completely. How do I know as a parent that I have genuinely accepted my kid? Very easily. You don't insist uh, that they turn out exactly like you. You don't insist that they're just like you. See, when we have kids, we want them to be what we want them to be. And we want them to like what we want them to like. When we like the same food, we want them to, we like a certain food, we want them to like a certain food. Here, you eat this macaroni on your plate, this is good stuff, I like it, you're going to like it, okay? Here, you eat these, uh, this cauliflower on your plate, I like it, so you're going to eat some of it, glory to God. We want them to eat what we eat, we want them to like what we want. And if your daddy played hockey in high school, well, by golly, you're going to grow up and play hockey in high school. And we want them to like hockey because we like hockey. And if we're good in math and history, well, you need to grow up and you need to enjoy uh, math and history. You need to be good at it. But they're not you. They are unique. Hey, listen to me. I want to say this as gently as I possibly can because I love you. But the world does not need another you. One of you is enough. We don't need two of you running around, amen? God didn't give us children to try to turn them into little mini-me's of us. Somebody say amen. amen. That's good stuff, okay? That's not why we have kids. And the pressure to conform doesn't just come from peer, or peer groups. Sometimes it comes from parents who insist their kids have to be like they are, have to like what they like, and watch the same shows that they want to watch, and on and on and on and on. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 5 says this, Love does not demand its own way. He is not irritable or touchy. He does not hold grudges and will hardly even notice when others do it wrong. I love, if I love my kids, I'm not going to demand that they like, have to like what I like uh, and do what I do and be what I'm good at. Uh, uh, I I'll let them be themselves and who God made them to be. The problem is, is that kids are many times getting this kind of message today that I can't be me. I have to be what my peers want me to be at school. And so we all have to all be the same thing. We have to all fall in line and do the same thing. We have to all like the same thing. And so i got to be what my peers want me to be. Or I need to be what my parents want me to be. And then when I get married, I need to be what my partner wants me to be. And then when I get a job, I need to get, uh, be what my professional wants me to be. And all of a sudden, you can find yourself lost in the midst of that. The starting point in bringing out the best in other people is accepting their uniqueness completely. Somebody say amen. Okay? My daddy was a pastor. Not a single time growing up did my daddy ever say to me, Brian, you ought to be a pastor. <laughs> not once. Not once. Have you ever considered becoming a pastor? Nope, he didn't say that. I did the same thing with my kids. My kids didn't know what to, what to do, and I suggested, well, uh, you know, I mean, there's a lot of stuff open in the medical field, and I suggested just because there's a lot of jobs in it, but I didn't care what they did. I didn't put any pressure on my kids to be, to be or do what I wanted my kids to do, whatever my children wanted to to do, okay, because we are all different. Uh, it may not have been my plan, but it, uh, but it was God's plan for them. We're all different. 
Our goal should be to help our children become what God wants them to be. See, kids are not people to be molded. They are things to be unfolded. And once you unfold something, you don't know necessarily what's in the middle of it. Many times my wife will do the laundry, and with each layer I unfold something new, and there's a new sock, there's a new set of underwear, there's something in there. You never know what's in there until you unfold it. But once you unfold it, you learn what's inside there. Uh, and God knows what's inside your children because he gave them their exact DNA. Now, when you have more than one kid in the family and they're all unique, it creates conflict. So you got to do a little bit of work in order to plug into them and find out what they like to do. My kids were growing up. Very regularly, we would have a date night with dad. Right? And I would take my children on dates. I would take my oldest, Brittany. She would go on a date with and we'd go do something. And then a, a, a week or a couple weeks later, whatever it's convenient, I would take Kristen out and it would be daddy date night. We'd go out on a date. And then I'd take Ace out, and we would go out on a date, uh, and I'd have a date with all three of my kids, and they got to choose whatever they wanted to do for that date night. And the next time, their sister might choose something else, and it might be better than they did, but they couldn't, be, they couldn't complain. There was no complaining because your week's going to roll back around again. It's just giving everybody their, u- their uniqueness. The truth is, God sovereignly chose your kids and intentionally put them in your family. He chose their DNAs. He chose which genes in them would be recessive and which genes would be dominant. And uh, God doesn't make mistakes and God knows what he's doing. So the first step in parenting and bringing out the best in your kids or in anybody else for that matter is to accept their uniqueness completely. Everybody have it? Here's number two. And we've got five of these, but we're only going to look at two of them today. Not only must I accept my kids' uniqueness completely, if I'm going to bring out the best in my child, I must affirm their value constantly. Write that down. Write that down, friends. And by the way, this is more than just simply saying, I accept you, kid. It's not enough just to accept your kids. you got to affirm them, love them, believe in them, celebrate them, enjoy them. It's not enough to just say, I accept you because God put you in my family. You have to affirm them. That's not always the easiest thing to do, and we don't do it enough. Most parents will affirm their kids at graduation or maybe at a birthday party or something like that, but kids need it all the time. I've counseled people for a good portion of my life, and you know what I've discovered? I've discovered that every one of us have this deep bucket that needs to be filled with affirmation from other people uh, uh, all the time because the bucket is never completely filled. And that's why I don't think that you can give too much affirmation to somebody because our need for it as human beings is limitless. So I don't think that you can praise your spouse or your children or your employee or anybody you care about and you give them too much affirmation because everybody has a hunger to be believed in, trusted, understood, affirmed, and valued. We all want something. Somebody to go, hey, you're important, you matter to me, you're valuable, your hair looks beautiful. Somebody say amen. <laughs> amen? <laughs> Glory to God, right? My wife asked me this morning, how's my hair look? You think I should do it straight or curl? And I said, oh, it looks fine. On the way, I'm, I'm, I'm preaching this because my wife hears it about three or four times on the way to church. I got to this point, she said, well, you didn't value me. <laughs> what you mean I didn't value you? I asked you how my hair looked. I said, it looks good. She said, no, you didn't. You said, it looks fine. <laughs> Whew, glory to God. So you got to get somebody, give somebody what they need, amen? You got to give them affirmation. Now, affirming people's value is different from simply accepting their uniqueness because you got to do it constantly. Because in your kid's mind, there's a scale on one side in their mind uh, where they put all of the good stuff that they feel about themselves. And then on the other side of the scale, they put all the negative stuff that the world is saying about them and that people in their own uh, sphere, their own family is saying about them. Things like you're worthless or you don't measure up or, or you talk funny or you're too fat or you're too skinny or you got pimples on your face. You need to do something about that or whatever. They're putting all these kind of things on the negative side of the scale and the scale scale is going down very, very quickly. And when you get more negative in your life than you have positive, do you guess what that ha- guess what happens? It creates, a, you sink into depression. And I got to tell you that there are a lot of depressed kids in the world today. Somebody say, have mercy. Okay? There are a lot of depressed kids in the world today. Because very few people are saying on a consistent basis, you're great, 
You're fantastic. God has chosen you. You're unique. And that, I'm telling you, that is a problem because kids want to feel special. I knew a kid once who was mad at God, mad at the world, and just angry all the time. And I got to tell you, I agree with you. It is hard to be loving to someone who is angry all the time. And this was one of those kids. He had an anger problem, but he had changed so much that by high school, he was chosen to give the graduation speech. And he got up and he started, he said it this way. And it's pretty insightful coming from a 17-year-old kid. Here's what he said. He said, my life was like a fire that was out of control, like a campfire, a bonfire that was out of control. It was sending sparks everywhere, and I would go on to people and burn them all the time. Anybody would get around me. And then he told his parents and his teachers and, 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 and his friends and other people who began to affirm and accept him and, and, and began to fill his bucket. And he ended the speech by saying, I'm still a fire. I'm still a campfire. But now instead of burning people, I warm people. And sometimes they even come down and we enjoy some s'mores together. I'm telling you that's the transformation of a child through acceptance and through affirmation it is amazing the power that that has in our life and I'm telling you if you don't affirm your child somebody else will somebody say amen okay and so we need to learn to affirm the value in our children okay here's what the Bible says about affirmation and value from the model of Jesus Christ who was the greatest parent that there ever was, okay? He's a perfect role model of a parent, Father God. Hear what he said in Matthew chapter 10, verse 29 through 31. What is the price of two sparrows? One copper coin, but not a single sparrow can fall to the ground without your father knowing it. And the very hairs on your head are numbered, so don't be afraid, for you are more valuable to God than a whole flock of sparrows. Last week, a bird flew into, we have two sliding glass doors on the side of our house, and last week, a bird flew into one of them, hit that window and went right down to the ground. When that happened, God noticed that bird. God knew that. God saw that bird. That's how much God cares about his creation. Friend, I want you to know that you are more valuable than a flock of sparrows to God. But why are you so valuable? And why are children, why are kids so valuable? Three reasons. Uh, the first reason why you're so valuable and why children are so valuable is because God custom made you. I told you before, I'll say it again. We did not come off an assembly line. You are not prepackaged. When God made you, God broke the mold. And there was never anybody like you in the past nor will there ever be anybody like you in the future, in the history of mankind. You are one of a kind, and that shows your value. Psalm 139, verse 13 and 14. You made all the delicate inner parts of my body and knit them together in my mother's womb. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. It is amazing to think about. Your workmanship is marvelous, and how well I know it. You were made by God. Now, if you see a picture that has been made by or created by Picasso... And you go look at another picture that was painted by or created by Rembrandt. And then you look at a stick figure that was drawn by Pastor Brian Rumor. They are not of the same value, trust me. They're not. Depending on who created it, gives it his value. Who creates something determines its worth. If I buy a guitar by a nobody, it's not going to cost as much as if I buy a guitar and the guy comes out and says, hey, this has been played by Eric Clapton. Well, now that thing's going to go through the rough, and he's going to want a little change because that has been played by somebody of value, right? Somebody famous. The fact that you were created by the king of the universe shows your, your value. You are created by almighty God and all God's people said. Amen. Amen. Glory to God. The second reason why you're so infinitely valuable is this. Jesus died for you. If you want to know how much you're worth, I'll tell you, you're worth dying for. You're worth God saying, I will sacrifice myself on a cross to save that person so that they can go to heaven. Jesus paid for your life with his life. In 1 Peter 1.19 it says, he paid for you with the precious lifeblood of Christ, the sinless, spotless Lamb of God. So God made you and God paid for you. Both of those uh, show your value. Did you know how much, uh, do you know how much something is worth? It's worth whatever anybody's willing to pay for it, and not, not anymore. That's it, okay? If you have a car and you think it's worth this much, well, it very well may be, but I'll tell you immediately how to determine the value of your car. List it. List it. Put it on marketplace. Put it for sale, sign in the window. Sell it. Sell it. 
and you'll get people call you and offer you a certain amount. You say, well, it's not worth that. Well, let me tell you something. It's worth whatever somebody is willing to pay for it, and that's its value. It's worth whatever somebody's willing to pay. How much are you worth? Well, look at the cross. Look at the cross. You are worth Jesus giving his life. You are valuable. Somebody say amen. You are valuable. He paid for you with his life. Here's the third reason why you're so infinitely valuable. God's spirit lives within you. If you're born again, you are the dwelling place on the house of God's spirit. 1 Corinthians 6, 19. Don't you realize that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and was given to you by God? You do not belong to yourself. How many of you have been out to California? Raise your left hand. Okay. Some of you get that. <laughs> Keep it in the pulpit, preacher. Out the pulpit. If you were to go out to Beverly Hills and you were to say, I want to buy a home, and a realtor would say to you, they would say, I'll find a home, I got a home, and, I, and I'll show you this home, and it looks nice, and they come out, and they give you the paperwork and everything, and it looks really nice, and, 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 and you like it, and, and uh, it won't be as nearly expensive as if you were to go to Beverly Hills and want to buy a home, and the realtor would come out and say, well, hey, guess what? Tom Cruise also lived here. Now, that is going to jack up the price a lot, depending on who lived in it. Well, I want to ask you, friend, who lives in you? The Spirit of Almighty God lives in in you so the trinity shows your value the father created you the son died for you and god's holy spirit dwells inside of you and that's how valuable you are and that's how valuable your children are when they open their lives to christ and he puts their spirit in their life they are of infinite value you say well pastor how can I affirm value of my kids I really want to do that I really want to do that how can I do that as a parent well there are three ways one way to affirm value in your kid is to give them your attention and specifically visual attention. And this works for anybody, not just for children. You want to affirm value in somebody, give them your attention. In other words, the way that you look at your kids reveals how much you value them. Everybody here knows that look at condemns, right? And you know that look that affirms. We've all received both of those looks. So we all do. When you, pray, uh, when you pay attention to something, it means you value it. People don't pay attention to things they don't value. We don't pay attention to people that we do not value. See, your eyes are actually tools uh, in order to love. They are ways for expressing love. In Matthew 10, 30, the Bible says the very hairs on your head are numbered. The message paraphrases it like this. Your Father in heaven pays great attention to you down to the last detail, even numbering the hairs on your head. Now, I want to tell you something. I don't know how many hairs I have on my head. I don't. Got no clue. God knows how many hairs are on your head. He also knows their original color. Cha-ching. Amen. And he knows how many hairs fell out in the sink this morning when you were getting ready to come to church. Glory to God. I'm telling you, that's how much God pays attention to you. And nobody is going to ever love you or pay that close attention to you as God Almighty. Do you know how a child spells love? Listen to me and hear me clearly. T-I-M-E. Another name for that is Attention. Attention. I have guys that tell me all the time, I don't know what my wife wants. I don't know what to get her. I don't know what to get the children this year. I don't know what they want. I buy them everything. I've got them everything. What more are they going to want? I can tell you what they want. They want your time. Amen? They want your attention. Because that is the most valuable thing that you can give to anybody. Right? I can always, I can give them money. I can give them things. Uh, but I can always find ways to get more money if I give it away. But if I give you a portion of my time, I cannot get that back. I cannot get more time. So when I'm giving you my attention, I'm giving you a part of me that I can never get back. And if I give it to you, what I'm saying to you is you are worth giving that away to. So when my attention is on you, it is saying it is because you matter to me. Matt and Kristen, wherever you're at, Alex and Ashley, Cam and Angie, DJ and Brooke. One of the ways that you affirm your kids is by paying attention to them and looking at them. Everywhere Jesus went, he gave a look, he gave a touch, he gave a word of affirmation. It's powerful when you plug into people that way. Another way to affirm value in your kids is not only through visual attention, but you can affirm value in your kids uh, through physical affection. God does that with us. In Hosea verse 11, uh, chapter 11 and verse 4, God said this about you. I led them with kindness and with love, not with ropes. I held them close to me. I bent down to feed them. One translation said I drew them near to me with affection and love. 
Every parent knows what he's talking about there, okay? Because we have all done that. It's a tenderness of a father or mother drawing your children in and showing them affection, saying, this is how much I love you. I want you to know something about human beings. Did you know that our skin was made to be touched? It was. Our skin was made to be touched. Matter of fact, you need to be touched in order to thrive. You do. Okay? You actually need touch. And I'm not talking about sexual touch. What I'm talking about is a tender touch, a loving touch. In fact, babies, if they're not touched enough as infants, they will develop what is called a failure to thrive syndrome where their brains are not developing naturally or normally at that point. It's why preemies who can't go home and are in, and are in incubators, many times NICU nurses will go in there and they will interact with the children and they will touch them and they will massage them and they will interact uh, uh, with them throughout the day. Because if they don't touch their skin, if they don't stimulate them, then they do not develop normally as the others do. I've heard of babies in third world orphanages who were left unattended. They were crying and crying and crying and nobody touched them, nobody picked them up. And so they're left there just crying and unattended and eventually they get to the point where they fall silent. Because they realize the cries don't work anymore. And now you can walk into that third world orphanage and it's totally silent. The whole orphanage is silent and they're stunted in their growth and their intelligence because nobody touched him. They just laid there in an orphanage uh, and nobody touched him. I'm telling you, your children need your touch. Uh, some of you dads say, well, I wasn't raised in that kind of environment. I'm not a touchy, feely, huggy, squeezy kind of guy. Okay, okay, get over it. Somebody say amen. You can do anything for somebody that you love. Somebody, Amen. Okay? And, and that's what you need to do. Always show affection to your children. Point is, physical affection and visible attention uh, shows value to our children. Here's the third way you can show value to people. I show value through verbal appreciation. Kids especially need attention, affection, and appreciation. And verbal appreciation means you tell people how valuable they are. Meaning when you send them a birthday card, you don't just sign your name at the bottom and put happy birthday. No, you write some stuff in there knowing they're going to go back and read that again and again. You write some good stuff in there about all the stuff you value about their life at that point in their life because they're going to go back again and that's going to encourage them. You know you went back and read those cards again and again. Amen. Right? So that's what you do. You give them verbal appreciation. God does that with us in Isaiah 43 verse 4. He said others were given in exchange for you. I traded their lives for yours because you're precious to me. You were honored and I love you. Are you telling your children that? I hope you do. I hope you tell them all the time how precious they are. Guys, are you telling your wife that? I hope you do. Ladies, are you telling your husband you are precious to me? I hope you do. Are you telling the members of your church you're precious to me and I honor you? I hope you do. God says, I love you to his children. It's verbal appreciation. Now, if you bought a house in the last five years and you held on to it, you understand what appreciation is. Appreciation means to raise something in value. Okay? If you've ever bought a new car, you also understand the definition of depreciation. Because the very moment you drive that car off of that lot, the value of that uh, vehicle goes down. Okay? So appreciation rises in value. Depreciation lowers in value. What are you doing with your kids? Are, are you raising their value by appreciating them? Amen? Are you doing that or are you lowering their value through downgrades and put down and depreciation? Every time I appreciate my wife, I raise her value to me, to the world, and to everybody else. And every time I appreciate my kids or grandkids, I raise their value as well. How can I affirm their value? Proverbs 12 verse 25 said this, Anxious hearts are very heavy, but a word of encouragement will do wonders. Does everybody agree with that? Hey, man, it does. I know it does in my life with each of my grandkids, and I've done it dozens of times, and I'll do it many times. They'll walk up to me, and, uh, and I'll say, do you know what Grandpa loves about you? <laughs> what? Absolutely everything. <laughs> I know you got That's it. Absolutely everything. Do that with your kids, and start when they're little. Start with a baby. Do that with your grandkids. Do you know what I love about you? absolutely everything. It'll help them to go through life with the assurance that they need to go through life and be healthy. One of the most powerful sentences that you can say to a kid or anybody else, uh, uh, it, it, for that matter, is this. You know what you would be good at? Do you know what you would be good at? Because many times we don't see in ourselves what other people can see. 
We don't see the talent. We don't see the potential. We don't see the personality that other people can see. Most of the world is just waiting to be given permission to just be themselves. So say to somebody you love, you know what you would be good at? And don't fill in the blank. You know what you would be good at? And then just let their mind go. And man, because it, it's just encouragement. It's a powerful affirmation. Listen to me and hear me clearly. A nation will never be stronger than its communities. A community will never be stronger than its churches. And a church will never be stronger than its families. One of the reasons we are having all the problems that we are having in America today is because right now 40% of all children in America are growing up without the presence of a father in the home. 40% of all kids in America are growing up without the presence of a daddy in a home. We are the first civilization in the history of mankind who is trying to pass on a civilization to the next generation without the benefit of moms and dads. The Bible said that God created men and women in the image of God. And that means men do not have a complete uh, image of God and women do not have the complete image of God either. It takes both masculine and feminine to express the image of God because God is bigger than just the masculine and bigger than just the feminine. And that's why the Bible put men and women on earth. And he says that men need women and women need men. We need each other in the Lord. And not just in marriage, but in life. You need a masculine perspective in your life. And I need a feminine perspective in my life. We need each other. In some groups today, 75% of the kids are growing up without a father in the home. That's bad news. That's terrible news. It's why America, America's kids are in trouble right now. Here's the good news. Studies have shown that the number one predictor of whether a kid is going to succeed or not is not their intelligence or how much money their family has. The number one predictor of whether a kid makes it in life or not is the presence of a caring adult in their life who affirms them and accepts them. And here's the interesting thing about that study. It doesn't have to be a parent. It just has to be somebody who cares. A coach, a Sunday school teacher, a neighbor, anybody, somebody who cares. It's why I wanted to start this series because I'm telling you there are literally thousands of young people, thousands of people in college, thousands of young people at home today who need love. Listen, you may not be a parent. You may never be a parent, but you still need kids in your life and kids need you because they need somebody to accept them and affirm them and spend time with them. Many of you like me, you were growing up, your parents split. You know the pain and confusion that that can do in your life. You know what that causes. And you, yes, you are a product of your past. You are. You definitely have been influenced by your past. But I'm telling you, although you're a product of your past, you do not have to be a prisoner of your past. Amen? You do not have to be. You can change it. It is a choice. As we wrap this up, I'm going to leave you with a challenge. If you're a parent, you need to be in a small group because you need the support of other parents in a group uh, you need that. And if you're a single parent, you definitely need the support of other parents because you can't do it on your own. So you need to be around other people who have children at all ages of life, little, middle, and adult children of all ages of life. No, we may not talk about parenting all the time, but when something comes up, there are people there to encourage you and support you. And so you need to be in a small group because it's there where we can help each other. I want to close with this one verse. As the band comes and we get ready to do our two closing songs. Proverbs chapter 40 verse 26. Reverence for God gives a man deep strength. His children will have a place of refuge and security. And that's applicable to moms as well. The key to becoming a great parent is becoming a godly person. That's worth the trip in here today. The key to becoming a great parent is to become a godly person. The truth is... Human love will always wear thin. And sometimes kids can be unlovable. But when they're in that place, that's when they need it the most. And that's why we need God's love and God's spirit and God's power and God's wisdom. And by the way, do you realize the two things that we looked at today, acceptance and affirmation, are the ways that your Heavenly Father treats you as well? Those are the ways that your Heavenly Father loves you. God is saying, I want you to treat your children the same way that I treat mine. God wants us to treat each other the same way he treats us. 
Your heavenly Father accepts your uniqueness completely. He don't want you to be somebody else. He wants you to be who God created you to be. And your heavenly Father affirms your value constantly. For the Father made you. For the Son died for you. And for the Holy Spirit resides in you. And I don't know about you, but that makes you pretty awesome. And all God's people said. Amen. Amen. Glory to God. Bow your heads in prayer, friends. Would you pray with me this morning? God, thank you for accepting me unconditionally with all of my faults and all of my warts. Thank you for accepting me, Lord, completely and for making me unique so that I don't have to conform and be like everybody else. There's nobody in the world like me for a reason because you don't want me to be somebody else. So help me to break free from the pressures of comparing and conforming. I don't want to be what other people want me to be. I want to be what you made me to be. And help me to help my kids break free from comparing and conforming. God, I want to appreciate people. And I want to raise their value. I don't want to depreciate them. Thank you that you affirmed my value in Jesus when you died for me on the cross. Thank you that your Holy Spirit lives in me. And because of that today, I want to be an agent of affirmation and affection and attention to my family my friends, my neighbors, my co-workers, and to the people in the church. I ask you to use me for your good and God's glory. In Jesus' name, amen.